the need for education for our people coming back home with their families was great. Mm. It was an opportunity, but it was also a nation building kind of uh, initial, um, motivating factor. The only challenge with navigating in our, in our economy here is we really have a challenge of skills and professional people who run organizations and companies. Thousands make millions. Mm. Thousands of people, that is to say. Mm. But only hundreds can keep it. So I, I would encourage people to do things that they enjoy. And by doing that and your passion for it, you really dig deep and try to tap into and make it work. Hello there. Our guest this week on the Long Form Podcast is Foster Mbundu, a prominent Rwandan businessman. He's the owner of MFK Group Limited, an investment company with a diversified portfolio that includes Gorilla Land Safaris, Caferwa Limited, which exports coffee, Garden Fresh, which exports fresh fruits and vegetables, as well as Anko Properties, a real estate company. Hello there. Before we dive into today's conversation, have you subscribed to our channel yet? If you haven't, do so. And remember to share your thoughts with us in the comments below and like this video. Your support means a lot. Now let's get into it. Mr. Fosten Bundu. Mm, hello. Welcome Thank to you. the long form. Thank you. So a person like you, what does your day look like? Person like me, meaning a businessman. Businessman, tycoon, <laughs> you know, captain of business. So my, my day, uh, as you say, uh, captain of business is, um, I start my day, of course, thinking about my business. But above all, I think I start my day by um, minding about my health and uh, lifestyle. So my first thing in the morning is the gym. Mm. I, I work out, I run, I swim at least five times a week. Oh. At least an hour a day mm. when, when I do. So that's how I start my day and um, followed by breakfast and I'm in my office at 10 a.m. Mm. So that's really, that's really the, the routine that I follow. But uh, when I have meetings, which happen sometimes between, uh, if I have somebody wanting to have a meeting at 8 or 8.39, those are the few times that I miss my workout. Mm. But I really religiously respect it. And uh, when do you call it a day and you head back home? So I um, normally, normally I will finish my office work at five. But I have a habit of having to meet someone, maybe one or two people in the evening over coffee to mm. To discuss relaxed, more relaxed, and uh, if somebody has really wanted to meet me for for either business idea or social reasons, I always feel that uh, those are people I meet outside of office hours, and they reserve between five and seven mm. to meet them either outside or actually call them home mm. if they are friends or associates of some sort. So really, my end ends around seven. Mm. Mm dinner and mm. I have family or friends for dinner and um, I try to retire by um, quite late actually but uh, I'm not looking at going to bed before 11. Mm. Yeah. So how, if you were to say on average how many hours are you sleeping because they always talk about you know how sleep is so important. Yes yeah, so I sleep at least seven hours. Mm. I try to do seven hours so if I sleep mm. by 11 I'm waking up at six and mm. sorry, seven hours. Mm. And um, I try, I, I, I'm in the gym by seven, and I'm done by, with the gym by eight. Mm. Shower and catching up on some urgent messages, if there are any, at, um, to the workout. Then by uh, nine, I'm ready for breakfast. I'm ready to head out by 10. Yeah. So I, I called you a captain of business because that's what I think. Most Rwandans know you as when they talk about Foster Bundu, they know about the businesses you have, the Garden Fresh, uh, you know, limos and, and what you're doing around coffee. Mm. Uh, what we do not know, however, is really anything about you. Um, so 
if you don't mind, could you share some of that personal story, the personal history, like something as simple as where and when were you born? Uh, what was your childhood like? Uh, where did you go to school? Uh, what was your schooling? Did you go to university? Did you, uh, were you born into a family of business people? I think there's a lot of curiosity around who you are as a person. Mm-hmm. So I think that myth is being thrown out of the window this morning. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so, that, um, so personally, I, um, I was born in 64. Mm. So Sunny, in um, another month and a half, I'm celebrating 60. Congratulations. Thank you. And um, I was born, my father was a businessman. Oh, um, I think he ventured into business when he was young. Mm maybe before he was 20, and we grew up looking, seeing him um, doing all sorts of uh, businesses, transport, mineral trading, fast moving consumer goods, agriculture products, and also farming. So, as, um, so really, I'm, I'm from a family of, of business, from a business-oriented family, Meaning my father was doing that. I had an uncle who had a poultry farm. I had another one who had a farm for passion fruits, tomatoes, really modern. And uh, I, I was living and they went for holidays up country in the village where we were born in Uganda. Mm. You'd experience this over the holidays, the, mm. the processing, the transporting, the, the, the payments, the customers. The... So it... it um, it rubs off. Mm. You, you, get, you get to know that life is about business and uh, that's mainly what you're seeing. And I think that had an influence on me. But um, as you're asking, uh, so I studied in um, where I was born in the early part of primary school and I went to Barara. Yeah. So where were you born exactly? In um, district of Kanong, current Kanong district in Uganda. Mm which was originally part of Kungiri district. Mm. You know, Uganda has been dividing these districts over and over. Mm. But and that was originally part of Kigezi district. Yes. So that's where I was born. And I uh, went to Barara for, to finish my primary school. And went to St. Mary's College, Kisubi. Mm. I did my high school and um, Makiri University for my Bachelor of Commerce degree. Mm. And I... Uh, Completed that uh, late eighties, and before I finished my degree, I um, I was even working with my with my father throughout my university time. Yeah. But more interesting is um, Uganda has gone through a lot of or went through a lot of upheaval. Mm. That, um, for example, my father had. Um, to basically go in exile two times. Oh, wow. In 71, when Amin took over power, there was, and he had been doing well. And, uh, so there was, um, there was this clamping down on people who were doing well by uh, that time. Mm. There was this thing about religion, the Muslims of mm. Amin mm. were harassing the non-Muslims, like in our, in our area, my father was doing very well. He was mm. progressive and, out of envy, jealousy by some people who are not successful, they really grabbed his property hmm. and wanted to finish him off. Yes, so he ran away. He, he ran away. I can't call it exile. He didn't get out of the country. Yes. <coughs> I guess it was more or less displaced from yeah, the It was maybe internal exile. Internal exile. So yeah. it went I did somewhere for months and we were not seeing him for many months. Mm. And uh, after he gave up everything that mm. they wanted, he, mm. he had his freedom and he started working again. And then uh, come 1981, when, um, when the Bocha was starts. in power, yeah. when uh, the NRA was, went into the, the royal struggle, then uh, my father ran away again, but this time out of the country. Yes. First through Kenya, then to Congo, because our home is near Congo border, so we mm. had relations, business relations and friends and family across the border. So he, he ran away in 81. And didn't come back until 85. Mm. 
but before then in the middle he's he could sneak in and hide mm. and greet us and mm. see us hiding in the house and then run away but uh, that was the experience but why i was saying that is because while that was happening and i was in uganda in kampala in kisubi at a very young age this is around the 70s this is no this is uh, early 80s. 80s okay so when i was around 17 mm. he introduced me to the banking mm. and he had some money on bank accounts and uh, he would need to buy um materials pesticides fertilizer spare parts for for, for, for equipment for tractors for things to, to to use at the farm mainly mm. going constructing things so i would get a special permission from my school wow because the head of school knew that our our, our circumstances basically every relative of my father was going to stay from kampala because again they grabbed his property Jesus. and took it and um, his um, warehouses were emptied the only thing they didn't take was a, a commercial building which was in the middle of town you know he was among the few people that time that that had a commercial property in town still mm. storage building commercial premises they couldn't take it you know, transfer it legally mm. but mm. they occupied it yes but so that time I was introduced to banking and dealing with um, checks and uh, reconciling accounts of mm-hmm. the bank and so it um it opened up my mind and um to you know being responsible dealing with all that when there's risk but i was quite young so that was the that was the introduction i could say and but also when i was in um when i had finished primary school waiting to go to high school <laughs> i keep saying this and wondering what age i was mm. but i told my father i didn't i want to do something mm. so i said every morning you do something at the farm so i said but these are the um, poor men uh they 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 they, they see what time the workers have come in to pick the tea in our mm. tea plantation and they count how many kilos they weigh every day mm. and they see the quality and then they pay them based on how many kilos they've, they've picked and they say, i can't do that i can actually can do it all that and yeah. every morning at 6 a.m i'll be at the farm yeah. for those two months or three of my holiday time mm. and i was young so assisting and working with his um his farm in the at the coffee at the tea plantation mm. it was uh <laughs> some young kid who is ambitious and trying to do something mm. but yeah. um my father was impressed so yeah he's um and i enjoyed it and uh and i must say that uh, when i went to for my senior one i had much more pocket money than many kids oh, because i can I imagine it. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> you you're talking about you know all these things and um at the time you know you were raised in in in, in Uganda and you were quite you're doing quite well um there's another section of Banyaranda who were i guess in the camps and all of that and going mm-hmm. through the Nyachibal experience um one uh did you actually even know that you were Rwandan like how did that what or had you you know you did you have that identity as Rwandans did you guys speak in Rwanda at home or mm-hmm. were you at the time i guess a mochiga thinking okay this, mm-hmm. these are my people okay so a uh, good question so in um, I, i have my father's sister was killed here during genocide in mm. 94 and the first time that i remember her visiting us was around 1973 74 and when she came is when they were discussing over breakfast with her brother my dad that she we started to hear mm. what wonder is this is my aunt who lives in kigali who is talking about people who ran away in exile in uh, i think the previous year i think 73 mm. some people there were some exodus like um then followed by what happened in late 59 60 61 and then we started i started to pick up that and getting interested in knowing and i remember asking my dad is auntie pifani going to be safe when she goes back to wanda because mm. 
the way she talks about the history, mm. you're talking about your relatives who are in Burundi, others are in Congo, others are in the camps, and then she's going back. How did she stay there? Mm. So they try to show us that not all, not all the targeted people mm. who run away in exile. Some stayed mm. because of different circumstances. So we, I start to realize that time that I'm a Rwandan with origins from Rwanda. Yes. So I was too young. But then the thing that uh, drove the point home was the elections of 1980. Mm. Because, we, 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 because we lived in the population in, um, in Kigezi district, we had, um, we had the right to vote. In mm. 1980, my father could vote, my grandmother, my mother, my parents. But um, people came and wrote on our doors in our homes mm. with, with red paint, putting mm. X on the windows and doors. Mm. All our houses of Banyarwanda speaking communities were, were marked like that. Mm. And it showed that we were in danger. And then um, when they were rec recording people at the, at the local government authority office, I remember my grandmother was there saying, we, we want to be, we want to be registered for voting, but you removed us from the, from the register. Mm. And the gentleman was saying, you're, you're, you're not Ugandans. <laughs> and we're here saying, grandma, what, what are you talking about? Yeah. So it's those things that, uh, that, that made us realize that um, there, is, there, there is something we don't really belong to. Mm. And um, much as we were young, we, we, we knew. And uh, we saw our parents who had, were worried and they were fearful because of the marks that on the doors of mm. these windows and, uh, and doors. But it passed. Mm. And um, for that reason, uh, we were supporting the, the Democratic Party mm. of that time because the people who were doing that were mainly UPC, mm. the, Oboti, mm. Oboti, the Oboti political party which was seen as targeting the Banyarwanda in Uganda. And um, we, we didn't win. <laughs> so that's why my father won read it yes. just after the election. Yes. So, so, that's, uh, so, we, 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 so when you asked me, so that, that made us aware. Mm. Then as we grew up, we started getting more visitors coming from Rwanda, who are here, mm. others from the camps. And then in 1979 also, when Amin was being driven out of government, people in the camps, in Kivara, Shumbrez, mm. those places, they actually were displaced. So they came towards our side, mm -hmm. trying to find a way to mm. go to Congo to be, to mm. be with other relatives. Mm. And my father accommodated many of them. Yeah. And he managed to convince others not to proceed, those who didn't have where people to find the other side of mm. Congo, and help them acquire land. And, have, and settle yes. in the way we were settling. So, mm. And those have become families. Some we moved back to Rwanda with them, uh, without mentioning the families, but we moved back to them and they're as good as family. Mm. And um, so that, that, that made us aware. And then, of course, um, when uh, 1986 came and uh, Bote was thrown out of government and the Tito Kelo regime, then our Rwandans who were fighting alongside uh, mm. NRA came back. And then um, we, we, were, um, we had security, we had, but then we started also learning that we have a home to liberate. Mm. So I think that's, that's the history. That's, the, that's how I can remember how, we, how I relate with realizing mm. where we belong. And um, mm. I was lucky to know um, the, the people who are in this leading our struggle and mm. um, relate with them. And mm. um, yeah. I'm happy to go around my country today. Yes, uh, that's that's for I think mm. that's a sediment that all of us have. Uh, mm. I'd like to uh, just ask you. So, <clears throat> so you graduate uh, around the late eighties, yes, and then you went straight into business. Maybe you should say that I I now went flat out into business yes. because I was actually. So, just to give you an example. Um, People went to school with it at university. There was to me traveling out of school at least one weekend in a month, mm. maybe 
find time off on Friday and also Monday, but go to Europe or Dubai. And uh, um, my father was trading in uh, gold. So I, I would, I would fly with this, this, uh, these materials and um, sail abroad because I was, um, I, I could travel. My father's generation was different. He was happy mm. to sell. To send his go from up country and sell it in Kampala, but yeah. they said we can do this better by actually taking it to where they take it, those that buy from us. So, so I was um, I was doing that, and I was um, also running uh, our shop that was selling fast consumer, fast moving consumer goods in mm. Nakivubo area, mm. like that the busy street, the Kikubo mm. of uh, mm. uh, like equivalent of Amateo or Nyabogogo. So mm. we were we were really in the thick of business and then. In a, in a very busy area. So, so when I finished school, I went straight into, into business. Um, yeah, so that was around, yeah, around 88. Mm. Mm, was, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, <laughs> you're talking about, I mean, today traveling by air is, is normal. People go to mm. Dubai just for mm. a good time, but mm. it must have been, I, I'm just trying to imagine uh, a young man, you know, with gold, and then you decide, you know what? I'm no longer selling it in Kampala or these right. other. I'm going we're straight. In the final market. I'm going to Europe. <laughs> yes. How do you, just even mentally? Yes. How do you take that step? How do you, one, even dare? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, 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 it's very daring if you think about it. Yes. You're, you're going to a place that you don't know. Mm to try to deal with people you don't fundamentally know. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a, it could be a dangerous business. Mm. <laughs> Is, was it because of, you know, how young you were and, you know, you do, you, you are ready and yes. willing to take that kind of risk? I think the younger you are, the more you have, um, you have appetite for risk, <laughs> so, so to speak. But, uh, whew. so the way it happened is one gentleman comes to my father and says, this gold of yours, you can make a bigger margin yeah. by taking it to Europe. And I'm there listening. Yeah. I'm saying, Daddy, we can do this. Yes, but how do I trust somebody with, um, with, with a lot of money of, of mine that uh, is entering a plane, going to some foreign place? I don't know what happened. Yeah. I said, I'll go with him. Yeah. So that's, uh, that, that's what happened. So, <clears throat> but even my aunt, that when I reached um, London, oh. the gentleman hadn't told me the whole detail how it happens. Yes. And so when I reached, I declared my, uh, my gold and I thought I'll take it with me yes. to my hotel and uh, I'll probably sell it the following day because we had some addresses. Um, oh. I think uh, you used to sell it in a place called Hatton Garden. Mm. So, when I reached, they said, we are going to register it, wait and seal it and give you a pink form. Mm. Then you'll go to a dealer mm. or a, 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 a company that buys and then you'll come to claim it with the company that buys because they have to pay VAT. Mm. The only way you can take this gold is if you pay VAT on it, mm. if you have cash or check. And I didn't have cash or check. Mm. So they said, but... The VAT is recoverable, but it's recovered by those who are registered entities. So if you pay it, you lose it. So yeah. when you look at the percentage, you can't remember what it was. Was it 15% or so? You don't have that additional margin. Yeah. So it loses. It doesn't make sense. So, so I go with my pink phone. So when I called my father that evening, I don't think he slept the whole night. You took gold. <laughs> Worth a lot of money. And all you have to tell me you have is a pink phone. A pink, pink piece of paper. <laughs> pink piece of paper. And those days you can't even... Can't even take a screenshot. You can't. You can't. He's just hearing about this form letter. So uh, the following day, uh, we, we managed to get a buyer and uh, went to claim our gold from the airport and um, came. And um, so when they were, the gentleman paid us and uh, he was trying to give me a check. Hmm. I said, I'm not treating no check because I never even tell my father I have a check. For, yeah. Because <laughs> I was young, you know, they. People's generations are different, so they, they want to feel the money in their hands. Yes. So I said, uh, we go to the bank and he give me my cash, I put it on my account. So, mm. so we had to make an arrangement with the bank and he pays me. And then that was the first time, and I used that money to open a bank account. Mm. So as early as um, 87, maybe, or late 86, I had a bank account. 
yeah. in London. Yeah. And, uh, and then I could probably call my father and say, I sold the other gold. Yes. We got so much more than what I bought in Kampala. Mm. The heart attack you almost got because of the ping pong, forget about it. Yeah. You can have your beer and, uh, and sleep soundly. <laughs> okay. So that was the beginning of something. It was an eye opener, but um, as you say, it was risky mm. and adventurous. But luckily, it um, turned out well. Mm. So that, I guess, was b- doing business in, 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 in Uganda. Yes. Uh, but I would like to know about your first forays into business here in Rwanda. Um, can you take us back to those times and those moments? It must have been quite challenging, wasn't it? So 94, when we, when we came into the country, for some of us who lived abroad, I'll tell you, I was doing, um, we were doing our, our, our business with my father and my brother. We were doing transport, we were doing mineral trading, still doing mineral trading, and we were doing uh, coffee business. But when we came here and wanted to do coffee business, we found there was a monopoly of a company called Wandex. Mm. You know the popular Wandex? Yes, yes. The, the Wandex area. So, so one, we, 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 we wanted to buy, but we found that the, there is a law that created that monopoly mm. that uh, where government had a stake. And that for us to actually do it, we needed to license, we need to, to go through certain processes. But I think cabinet at that time liberalized it, removed mm. the monopoly. So we're able to buy coffee and we're able to export it. But there were challenges. There was coffee in the fields, there was no labor. Mm. There was no labor people to. Because everyone was in either Congo or people dead. People were killed, people were dead. Mm. Others were in exile. So it, it was complicated. You couldn't even know how to, to plan what you get. But we managed to gather whatever we could and we exported coffee to the East African countries, neighboring because they had processing capacity. Because mm. Rwandex said that they couldn't process our coffee. It was the only coffee processing plant in the country. Mm. Can you believe it? Mm. And then uh, they couldn't process the coffee because their employees could not be allowed to come in the country to run their factory because the insurance companies would not give them insurance cover. Mm. That's 94. 94, because they said it's a danger zone. Mm. If you go, you were, and they were experts running it. So mm. we couldn't process it. We couldn't process it. To put up a processing plant, you needed, you needed equipment, you needed to set it up, you needed a building. A warehouse kind of hunger, put in equipment, import it, fix it. And coffee has a season. You mm. have to process it a certain. But also, I think um, there was no time to, to, to do all that. So we exported the coffee and, um, and, um, and we started building capacity to process locally, which we ended up doing mm. um, around early 95. Mm. So when you talk about how challenging it was, it gives you the picture. Mm. It was really challenging. Um, then the other, um, the other thing that was a challenge is um, we were importing bags for use in agriculture, you know, for produce of, you know, I was importing, for example, gunny bags that people mm. were going to use for packing their beans, maize, coffee. Mm. And I was also doing transport because uh, we had many non-government organizations and that were renting vehicles for relief work, for, for different kinds of things. So we had a um, problem of, uh, you had your workers, drivers that are driving up country, they are mm-hmm. for the security and um, safety. And um, those were the challenges we're getting, but also, I want to tell you that even when we're talking about processing capacity, electricity, access to electricity, having left communication, telephones, it was really a challenge. But um, thanks to RPA for the, even the army specifically, they, they really did a lot to create security, to, to also manage the little resources that were there to, 
and to put things in place, change, you know, create laws, environment mm. that would ha- help us to, to take off. So come 95 things started stabilizing. Mm. And um, after that, we started really feeling um, feeling better business environment around the a few, a few years down the road, the 2000s, and mm. every year you could see that things were improving for the better. Mm. Yeah. So, but um, it was it was it was tough. Yeah, it was tough. But um, considering where, what the country had gone through, we need to give um, to to commend the efforts of government that time to have stabilized the situation. Mm. And for people to have eventually come in, uh, right now we're talking about processing capacity in the coffee industry. Processing plant for coffee now is uh, like every other you turn and there's a processing plant in a district in the mm. village. Yeah, so it's been a journey, 30 years, but um, yeah, a lot of things have changed for the better. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you have various business interests, coffee, real estate, horticulture, and even if I'm not mistaken, education mm-hmm. uh, as well. Um, why did you choose those particular sectors? And is there one that you can actually say that this one is my favorite one? So as, as I said, uh, when we were starting, the, you see, we, 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 my, my, as I told you, my father was farming mm. from tea plantations, banana plantation, coffee, and coffee trading, and coffee processing. That's already a good culture. Mm. Um, then, I, then, uh, then as a family, we, 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 we were doing transport, long distance transport mainly, transporting goods. And... Um, as I said, when, when my father lost everything, the only thing he did lose that time was a property in the middle of the city. Mm. So that was property development. The, so when you think about it, when, I, when I'm in horticulture and coffee, it's continuing what mm. I, was, I found myself into as, mm. as a young boy growing up, seeing my father do these things. When you talk about transport, it's the same thing. When you talk about property, it's the same thing. But uh, as you said, I have an interest in an uh, in education institution <clears throat> that, um, that I think came out of um, the need to, to tap into an opportunity. Because remember, in earlier, on our earlier discussion, I was telling you about how uh, these experts wouldn't come to Rwanda because they wouldn't get uh, insurance cover. Mm. So likewise, our own Rwandans who wanted to come home to, to serve their country wouldn't travel, he wouldn't, would find it difficult to come home when there's no school for their kids, yeah. no hospitals, no homes, no houses, but that was got sorted out. But so the need for education for our people coming back home with their families was great. Mm. It was an opportunity, but it was also a nation building kind of uh, initial motivating factor mm. that um, even us ourselves wanted to bring our families here. So uh, a few of us decided let's let's go to a school and, uh, and that's how it happened. So, but when you ask me what is my favorite, my, my, my businesses are, um, I enjoy going to each of them. It's very hard for me to point out which is my favorite. Mm. It's like saying that, uh, which of your children do you love them? <laughs> <laughs> but most parents, if you ask them, it's, if you were to put a, a light detector, te- te- you, can, you, can test, you can check their pulse. And, yeah, you'll see <laughs> the truth will come out. Yes, you will see Yes, and, and the school, in the, the school that we're talking about, that's, it's Green Hills, right? Yes, that's yeah. right. Mm. Mm. Yes. So you have no favorite business? Mm. Mm. I, I, but um, the, I used to find, um, and I still do find coffee business very interesting. Mm. And why? 
I think it has a lot of potential mm. for scale. And, um, and I think that's why I feel that there's so much untapped potential around it that, that mm. it can, can grow into something very big. Mm. So when you ask me, when I'm looking, I'm looking at the potential in our portfolio. Mm. But um, right now, I'm looking at, um, and, uh, and I'm not looking at too much right now. Um, if anything, I'm trying to consolidate and scale, stabilize them, um, and grow into what, what I have. But fintech opportunities are mm. tempting. Mm. And again, it goes to what I was saying about scale. I think they are scalable. The opportunities are immense. The potential is so much that I'm looking at a few, I'm working on a few, a few ideas related to fintech. Locally? Locally. And when I talk about scale, that can grow mm. regionally and internationally. Mm. Would you like to partner with us here at the Long Form? If you do, you can send an email to us at longformronda at gmail.com. Partner with us and become part of Rwanda's most exciting and in-depth podcast. Like everyone else, mm -hmm. uh, you have 24 hours in your day. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure that you, you on top of all the things business-wise, uh, have, have enough time for family and friends and also keep some time for yourself? Um, that must be very difficult uh, in terms of that time management. And mm -hmm. secondly, when you do have some time for yourself, what are your favorite things to do? Uh, do you have hobbies? Are there books that you really like to read, movies? So um, the way I find time to, to be on top of things is to assign responsibility. to me. So I don't manage any of my companies. Mm. I oversee. So when, uh, when my managers are doing a good job, um, I feel it and I, I enjoy the benefits. And when they are not, then it's time to, to do some house. <laughs> <laughs> you change the managers. Yes, you change the manager or beef or uh, find a way to support them. That makes it easier. Mm. So, so I delegate. That I, I must say that that helps me. The only challenge with delegating in our, in our economy here is we really have a challenge of skills and professional people to run organizations and companies still we still do with all the people who are coming out of the ALUs and the CMUs and the, so the so, universities so you, you need to go back to my, uh, for the kind of portfolio that I have we, we do but you, you may get a good manager but the support team mm. and I think you have to remember that much as we're churning out these young minds brilliant and hard working modern we are also growing first rate. Mm. There are many companies that are coming in to set up and they're fighting for talent. And um, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a good problem to have. We are turning out this, these numbers. We are, we are but true, they, 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 there is numbers, we're getting good people, but also the demand is growing, but we, we can still do better. We can, but it's a matter of time. Mm. But I must say that we, we are in a much better place than we were before. Yeah. Because if we were not, I wouldn't be delegating and getting results. Uh, so that speaks for itself. That when you, when you, when you ask me how, do I, so when, if I can manage to do that, yeah. and um, I know that um, you can't make money and make progress in your businesses without caring about your own body and health. So I, I, have, I have time to myself. I, um, I, I have enough time to rest. I have, um, I read books. I read, I read every night before I go to bed mm. to wind down. Even if I read 20 pages. What kind of books are you reading? Um, the, the, I just finished, um, <clears throat> Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm. That's a popular book, you know. Mm. I read, um, uh, yeah, I've been reading, so I read mainly business books. Mm. And this book that uh, I, I, I was about to, the, 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 I was about to make a grave mistake, business about to make a grave mistake, something like that. That's a title waiting for me to read. The, 
business rivalries. Uh, there's another title that I, I bought recently. Then um, I also have um, I read recently the Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. Mm, mm. And um, yeah, I'm reading books every, every, every almost every evening before, before I wind down. That's the time I have to read. I watch my Premier League. Mm, what is the night? It isn't uh, doing well, so it's but, not. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, 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 I stopped watching. Uh, I realized it's just giving me high blood but pressure for no. So, <laughs> so it's not. Uh, it's not something I look forward to, but I get tempted and I still tune uh, in and uh, just give yourself strength. Yes. Uh, so I, I, I watch my soccer, and um, I like to follow news, mm. international news. I like to follow Barry Zakaria's uh, mm. program. Mm. I, uh, I, I, I tune Bloomberg. It gives a lot of snippets about the economy, world economy, and. Mm. Uh, I watch and I read. Yes. I really spend, so when I told you that I wake up around six, so between six and seven, I'm actually reading. Mm. I mean, the social media or downloaded some, some articles and um, yeah. So it's, it gives me, it opens up my mind in the morning. I mm. will uh, look at New Times, I will look at uh, The Economist, you know. But within that one hour, mm. Except, except for responding to messages the previous day that I felt it's getting too late to start chatting. Mm. I spend the rest of the time catching up. Yeah. I would like to uh, get your thoughts on the book that you just finished, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. There are a lot of people who have mm. read it. It's yes, quite yes. a well-known uh, book, mm. slightly controversial. Mm. Well, I guess in this case, you'd be the rich dad. Uh, mm. Uh, did you, what was your key takeaway from that book? Rich dad, poor dad. You know where um, the, these kids, the, 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 the poor dad, the poor dad's kid mm. going to work for money. And um, my, my, but maybe to answer the regular question, my, my key takeaway. I, I, I discovered some things that I hadn't really given so much thought about mainly, mainly in the, in the Western economies about real estate and mortgages. Hmm. He talks about, he talks about how People, when they are proud that they own a home, how actually it's driving them into debt and giving them stress. So it's not about owning the mortgage, but he was talking about more about placing money that mm. can earn more mm. than taking, taking on more debt. So really, he was one of these. I, my take was the, the principle that cash is king. Mm. There was one. And um, he, you, you learn something about leveraging your assets against debt to a certain optimal. And um, it, it's it's a good book that uh, that when you when you think about it. But again, it's for the Western economies. I think that model is is a, is a little different for us. But that's where we're heading. So, mm. so it's um. I, 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 I realized the importance of making your, 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 your resources earn more mm. and what's the cost of borrowing to grow versus growing your own portfolio in a however small way whereby you, you limit risk and um, you don't expose yourself so much by over leveraging. Mm. That was one of the takeaways. Um, otherwise, they, they, there's a lot. There's a lot that um, one can pick up from that book. I know, it's, uh, but you said it's controversial. So no, I mean, was, but I mean, <laughs> so, some, some, there's been discussions, especially <laughs> around the author himself mm. and the fact that, you know, he, he writes all these things, but even he's been bankrupt 
countless times. Mm-hmm. So, so, so the, the conversation has been about the fact that this man is giving yet, financial advice. Yet he hasn't practiced it himself. Absolutely. You know, it's one thing. To, mm-hmm. they, they, there is a saying that, um, what is saying? They, they say that thousands make millions. Mm. Thousands of people, that is to say. Mm. But only hundreds can keep it. Mm. So he may be telling us what you can do to make money. Mm-hmm. But he's among those hundreds who fail to, uh, to actually to keep it. Mm. So, by many reasons, but mm. but uh, maybe that doesn't explain much mm. because there must be a reason why he goes bankrupt. Maybe he's teaching us something and he's not reading his own book. Maybe he's reading his own book and uh, mm. people become adventurous and excited. Yeah, you know, people get excited. Mm. Uh, we get excited, and then you are you are driven by emotion rather than common sense, mm. and you can end up making a mistake, much as you're brilliant and strategic. Mm. But the other thing I wanted to tell you about uh, rich dad, poor dad, the, <clears throat> there is the, the, there is there is where he talks about a lady that was a good writer. Mm who was winning, who was being recognized as a good writer. And she's here meeting somebody else, seeing somebody referred to as a bestseller, whose book was a bestseller one after another. And she's telling this lady that you need to, you need to invest in marketing. You need to invest in selling and promoting what you write. And this lady was struggling. And um, he's... He's telling her, the gentleman is telling her, you need to write, you need to sell your book, you need to go to shows, you need to promote your book, you need to do something to be known. Then this lady was saying, how can you compare me to so-and-so? Mm. You know, I'm a Rolls Royce. That one is some um, cheap mm. car that you cannot start telling me to be like. This is that when, they, when he sells so many books on his book, mm. He's the best seller. Yes. He's not the best author. Mm. So sometimes about selling. Yes. The importance of selling, the importance of, of uh, marketing, the importance of, um, of um, publicity, the importance of branding, the importance of... It's, it's not so much what is the content. Mm. It, it is so... That, that is what is... Um, funny about it, but the, the power of selling, the power of promotion, of product promotion, the power of branding. So, and he says, if you can do the following, you can be the best author, but best seller. But if you ask me, do I want to be known as best author or best seller? I'd rather be the best seller mm. because I have money to show for it. Yes. So that's one of the takeaways. Mm. So a, a, a lot of young people <clears throat> Look at you and the other, the mujishas and you know the, the we know the names. We know the names, uh, the 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 titans mm-hmm. of our business. We a lot of young people look at you, men and women, as role models. Uh, you know they want to drive the cars that you drive. They want to live in the in the mansions you live in. To these young people who want to be like you, what would you tell them? What should they be doing? And what shouldn't they be doing? Secondly, uh, can you share your secrets to not just business success, but again, like what you were talking about earlier, uh, business longevity? So, one, I think I'd rather give some caution here. Mm. Because at whatever level we are, we look at somebody else who's doing better. But it's always good to be careful and say, and, um, and chew what you can swallow. And take on what's enough. Otherwise, like I was saying before, you don't want to end up over leveraging yourself and opening yourself up to risk because you're trying to grow and trying to catch someone who's ahead of you. So even me, when you ask me, there, there, there are people I look up to, but I'm not, I have ambition to grow, but 
in a measured way. And why I'm saying this is that for pe- people need to understand that um, for me, my, my, my principle is that um, in whatever business that I'm doing, I want to enjoy it. Mm. I keep saying that when I wake up to go to work and I come back, like I said, if, if, if a business is giving me stress and uncertainty and um, I'm not enjoying it, I'd rather, I'd rather just close it and um, not be a victim of the is it they call it a sunken cost fallacy? Mm. Well, you just keep trying you to... just keep trying to throw... I end up throwing good money over bad money. Mm. And again, you're not enjoying it and you're stressing. So my, my, my principle is that um, <clears throat> I do a business that I'm enjoying and I'm covering costs. And at the end of the day, if it makes much more profit, it's a bonus. Mm. So I, I would encourage people to do things that they enjoy. And by doing that and you have passion for it, you really dig deep and try to tap into and make it work. Mm. So I think it's important not to just copy someone, but to think through something and, um, and measure and try it and not go in in a very big way. I think it's better to go slowly so that if you make a mistake, you can correct it. So what, what they should be doing is really planning better. You'd rather spend more time planning than, and you spend less time executing mm-hmm. because that way, when you plan well, you, you really try to limit risk. But again, business is about risk. Mm-hmm. It's about risk. So you cannot try to venture into business that has no risk. It's important how to mitigate risk and how to be prepared for it. But um, so what they should be doing is think about something, do it, and if you want to scale it, scale it in a measured way and always be mindful of risk. Suppose this doesn't go the way you plan. What is the fallback position? Mm. Because um, your bankers and finances and creditors will not be kind. You have to be very careful. So uh, that's something they shouldn't be doing, to rush, to try to grow so fast because you can only do so much. And, um, and uh, what I was telling... Um, just to just just make to give it more clarity. As I told you, I like to read books. So I read Rupert Murdoch's book. Mm. You've you know Rupert Murdoch, mm-hmm. uh, News Corp. And um, we can also even at our age and, and level of business learn something from it. And he was um, he was competing with Maxwell. Mm. Uh, Maxwell, the mm. other gentleman mm. who was mm. also the British in, in the mm. media, British. Mm. And they were buying, they were on a buying spree of papers. They were just taking over papers in Australia, in the UK, in the USA, mainly of those three markets. So they were really competing. And Mado could not understand how Maxwell was managing to buy, pay off people, buy. And Maxwell was not understanding how Rupert is doing it. But Rupert was borrowing, mm. borrowing so much, over leveraging. You know, as I said, we're all careful, like the gentleman of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You get excited or driven by emotion for some stupid reason. Mm. That's what we need to be careful about. To wait and think and say, am I being driven by a business motive or some other motivation? And once it ceases to be business motive driven, I think you need to check yourself. But you can only tell people so much. They will, mm. They'll still listen and make the same mistake. I could make the same mistake. Mm. But the interesting thing is, I don't know if you read that book, but what was happening is Maxwell was eating with the pension fund mm. of his employees, mm. which was criminal. Rupert was over borrowing. Without telling you much, Maxwell mm. killed himself yes. or whatever circumstances he, you know, yes. it's never it's controversial also. Uh, he, he, he drowned, mm. he drowned himself or whatever happened, it was, you know, he, he, he died. He's no longer with us. He's no longer with us and he couldn't take it. The heat was too much. Mm. But at the same time, when he was drowning, mm. Rupert Murdoch could not even pay his bill yes. in a restaurant using his credit card or hotel because mm. it had been blocked because he was over leveraged. Yeah. They were calling on his debts, loans, and he wasn't paying. And um, that's according to the book. It's written in the book. So, mm. uh, 
can I can talk about it. And um, I think that's what it says that uh, he could his 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 credit rating was that low. Mm. But he was lucky that at a dinner event he met a small banker, a, a, an MD, a CEO of a small bank that was dying for to get business, mm. and he took a gamble on him and rescued him. Mm. The rest is history. Grew and Madok was already gone, mm. but uh, rather Ruk Maxwell well. was already mm. gone. So what, what I was telling you is that if, if you reach a point, if I see my neighbor and uh, somebody in society here that we know each other and I see he's going very fast, is you don't know what he's dealing with. You don't know his exposure, you don't know his risk, you don't know the risk appetite he has, you don't know he could count on luck, maybe you, be, you know, may not be lucky, mm. but I think we all need to be measured in, in what we do and the, the risk we take and the gambles we venture into mm. because business is about numbers and then numbers have to add up in projection and in uh, implementation. Mm. So I, I would tell them to, to be measured and always be mindful about risk, but also to try to enjoy what they have because there's always so much to achieve and you, can, you cannot always achieve everything and if mm. you were driven by one motivation, you may be pulled back by something else. Mm. So this is the last question for you. Mm -hmm. So to the young people who are listening to this conversation uh, right now, who are thinking of starting their business journey, maybe they're, they're in school, putting together a project, maybe it's a young uh, person in the village who's thinking that, you know what, maybe I have all these bananas, maybe I should try to do some kind of banana wine. You know, starting the, that business journey, if there's something that they should take away from this conversation, what should it be? So, we're already looking at them as people who want to do business. Mm -hmm. So that, that already answers the question. So I wanted to tell you that not everybody's cut out for business. I mean, but explain, explain what, what you mean by that. By that is that, um, <laughs> you know, business, you have to feel it in yourself. So mm -hmm. if, if you're hesitant and you're just being driven by peer pressure, I think you resist the pressure. Maybe a better way to teach in a school or university mm -hmm. or writing books or doing uh, art, or um, getting employed somewhere in an official capacity, so that you need to do business. You have to feel it in yourself. You have to mm. be driven. You, have, you really have to feel that you're driven. Mm. I like it when you talk to people and they say, business, I don't feel it in me. I, I, I fear risk. Mm. So, you, you know, they won't enjoy doing it. If all the time they're fearing and worried. They won't even take a decision. Mm. That is bold, that is you take on risk knowing it's risky, but you know, you are up for it. So that's why I was saying that. So mm. if we're looking at people who are already thinking, no, they are they're venturing into business. If there are people in Rwanda, I'll tell them they're in the right place. Mm. I don't know if you know Sunny, but um last week I was speaking to a banker who told me that uh there are funds now. We know we always fight cry about access to finance for especially startups. But these funds now that are being guaranteed to the tune of 100 million francs yeah. based on the activities you have and I think you can go, go with it. And I think soon it will be increased to 350. So where yeah. people had a constraint of security. Yeah. As long as you can show you start small, there are funds that are being available to, to to now deal with the issue of access to finance. So if they're here, they're in the right place. If they're in Rwanda, it, is, um, it, is a it has a business environment that is conducive to business growth uh, with a um, very good business environment. So I would encourage them to, to take their chance and, and try out something right now. And um, what I would, I also encourage them to do is that if you can be able to convince a few people with like-minded people and join forces, mm. collaboration, collective investment, 
can help. Because you put your resources together, you work together. Mm. It's really putting capital together. It's a small way of really amassing capital. You can grow together rather than going it alone. Mm. Uh, so you can, um, I would encourage young people to see how to, to work together because if you have four or five people, one of you may point out something that another may not be able to, to see. Mm. But also the, the idea of joining our resources together not only do you actually become substan you know, fairly big, but also you can actually qualify for those funds I was telling you about because if you join the little activities you're doing together and you combine them, then you are, your cash flows are, can show that you qualify for so much that they can give you without a guarantee by guaranteed by the, the business history that all of you have put together when you come together to join forces to mm. do something. Mm. Yeah. So you talked about, you know, those who are operating, operating in Rwanda. Um, as you know, Rwanda has a huge diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I promise, the last question. It's just that you, you said something about those who are here. There's a lot, a huge diaspora. There's, you know, we were just in Rwanda Day um, a few weeks ago. And, and a lot of them, there's a lot of conversation about how does the diaspora engage with Rwanda mm -hmm. and, and, and how do they invest into the country? What, and very often they, they, they ask them, they, they ask about, you know, how do we do this? Um, how, in your opinion, can someone in the diaspora, you know, get engaged in business? Uh, would you even advise them to, um, and how do they? How would they? How do you advise that they manage those kind of relationships? Because a lot of them are, are, are still there, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll never actually come, or they don't have the time to come to Rwanda, live here, and you know start their businesses. But mm -hmm. they still want to uh, be a part of, of of our growth journey as a country. Mm -hmm. So you know, when we talk about diaspora, I'm seeing a number of quite many people out there that have that, um, that idea in mind. But the, the, there is, um, a, as I told you that I've been talking to many people who, uh, looking at FinTech, there are many savings schemes that are coming mm. that, are, that are driven by um, these digital technologies that are that are now mushrooming and our young people are, are doing something about it. Every other week I meet people about applications that they're developing, about saving, about investing. And I would encourage them, both the people developing these applications and platforms yeah. to reach out to the diaspora, to show them their business, um, their value proposition, what, what they're trying to offer. Because the, the few that I've talked to look promising. Mm. The only thing they lack is scale for them to be able to reach the break-even point. Because they tell you if we can, if we can access so many people on this platform, mm. then we can have so much business and we can invest these monies even among ourselves. People are borrowing. There's these, um, these scoring um, uh, mechanisms that uh, fintech companies here trying to work on and develop, but they, have, they still have some mechanisms they are using right now. But I think that's one way of small contributions coming from diaspora, because it's not big sums of money, but it's mm. small amounts coming from many people. Mm. And I think with our regulator central bank putting in place regulations that govern the security of, of those funds, of those contributions coming to these platforms, I think it's one way of, of accessing those funds. Or there's something they're talking about, talking about Rwanda Day the other day, mm. about doing something about reducing the, the cost of transmitting funds mm. here, mm -hmm. but also being able to have, once that is done, I think there was something that's being done to have like the way it's, this, these funds are collected and uh, can be invested in our stock market, in our... Um, Th those are the areas that I'm looking at because the diaspora people, when I look at them, they are normally doing salaried jobs, they're earning money at the end of the month. Yeah. 
they want to put money aside every month, bring it home where it has a better return than, than abroad there where they are. So and I think these, these platforms can go a long way in making, in, in, in bringing that, because they talked about $470 million, but I think we raised Yeah, 470, yes. Uh, 2022, actually. 2022. So, uh, so 2020 might... must have been more. Mm. If, 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 if certain things can be done around that, if those platforms can improve their scoring mechanisms, if they can be put in place because I understand it's lagging, and uh, if they can improve the, 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 the commissions that they, they are losing by sending these, these amounts to Rwanda, and if these platforms can scale up, I don't see why in a couple of years we don't reach a billion mm. dollars reaching our economy and being deployed in business activities or to individuals that are borrowing and returning mm. based on the mechanisms today that fintechs are using mm. to, to, to evaluate the credit worthiness of, uh, of their, their clientele. Mm. I think it's one, it's one area that can that can, can have results. But it's a good question you ask about our diaspora because there's a lot of resources that we could harness from the diaspora community. Okay. Last, last question. And this one's a promise now. You're, as a businessman, when you look at the running economy, short term, medium term, long term, you know, we, we talk about these numbers, GDP growth, 7%. How bullish are you? about the fact that we might or are likely to reach our development goals in terms of business and, and, and the money that's really transacting in our economy. I'm, I'm so positive about our economy growing. It's, um, <clears throat> so among the businesses we're doing, we're doing um, property development. Um, and somebody told me that, um, you know, there's so many properties coming up and people are going to fail to get clientele, customers. Mm. But then two things came to, I, 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 I experienced two things. When you speak to Rwanda Finance Company, the International Financial Center, the numbers of, of people that are, are coming to register their companies here, mm. Is amazing. Really? Yes. Do you want to share with us? I don't, I can't. Not the exact number, but but I hear Mm. that the the interest that is being picked, COVID slowed down things, but the the, the level of interest and the type of companies that are showing interest is is something that gives you confidence that we are headed in the right direction with our financial center. That is one. Mm. I have a commercial building in the city that um, we had spaces that were not being taken up in the last one year. We acquired a building about a year ago in, in the CBD. And in the last few weeks, we have more than seven companies mm. looking at space and we can only supply to three. Mm. And, we are, and, and I'm thinking when I look at them, one is... Um, digital insurance, something. Mm. Another one is a FM radio station that's going to change the landscape of broadcasting with FM. Another one is um, a tech company. Another one is um, a bank. Another one is um, some private sector company. But I could go on and on. So when I look at it, I say, we now have no space. Mm. But that is on that is when you talk about people coming looking for space for offices. Another is also another tech company from Germany, mm. fintech. And then I'm looking at people interested in space to have their offices here. That's one. And you look at the, these are physical people. These are not the projections that we're looking at. I've been discussing with very Rwanda Financial Center, who who have their facts of how much mm. they are corresponding with these people. But Sunny, I visited Gabiro Hub. Mm. Now that the, it's yeah, the agri the business day. hub. Mm. So what I keep, what it was good you asked this question because it would have been not not complete of, uh, of me to, to to go without talking about agriculture and value addition in agriculture and the benefits therein. 
for employment and uh, foreign exchange earnings and uh, food security. It's amazing mm. because you cannot you cannot talk about the economy growing. You're not talking about feeding its own people, employing its own people. And our biggest employer, our biggest food source is agriculture. But when you look at Gabiro Hub, what they are doing, I have mm. I have a chunk of land there that mm. we are located. We are, we are trying to, to, to develop it now, irrigate, put irrigation infrastructure. You look at um, Kirehe, the, the, the Naiko, that's Warren Buffett. Uh, so, you know, um, that, that, is, that, that has developed that um, infrastructure and look at the plants they have to develop, Gabiro Hub parts two. And you look at the employment opportunities that are coming, the experts that are coming, the, the food security, the, the, the ability we'll have for export, to export agriculture products. It's amazing because mm. it's, it's one low hanging fruit that I think, I can't say we haven't paid enough attention to it, but I think that uh, the government efforts, and even the private sector efforts are commendable. Mm. And so I talked about FinTech, talked about Kigal International Financial Center and the interest they are, they are seeing. I talked about agriculture. And I talked about, talk about mice and the conferences we have today. You know, KICC is booked. I think for the next 12 months, you wouldn't get mm. a weekend or room for so many days. So why, why wouldn't I be bullish? So it's a, yeah. It's a, it's um, and I'm also optimistic, and, mm. and uh, so I may be driven by optimism for my country, but uh, but I think really we have to we have to thank our leadership for it, and the only thing I can tell you is that um, there are things that may not have gone right, uh, both from um, public sector and even private sector. Mm. I think we all need to do more to to harness these opportunities while we still can. Because um, the kind of leadership we have today that is making us be able to deliver and attract this kind of interest, we need to take advantage of it now. Mm. But um, if I sit here with you 10 years from now, mm. we'll be saying that we were right to be bullish. <laughs> and you'll be 70 years old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good winning. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. Yes. Uh, yes. Mr. Mbundu, thank you so much for joining me. I Good hope you pleasure. enjoyed yourself. I did, I did. Thanks so much, Sam. Yes. It was a pleasure. Thank you. If you enjoyed the conversation today, share your thoughts with us on our social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok.